So, shipping a Mac Catalyst app. Wait, wasn't that just called Marcipan a year ago? And what about the UI kit for Mac? And why would anyone even care now that we have uh, the new hotness, Swift UI? Welcome to my talk about Catalyst, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, this is a brand new talk for a brand new topic for a brand new product. If things are a little bit rough, uh, please bear with me. I'm trying my, guess, my best given the circumstances, and I promise there's memes and Star Wars references. Now, first of all, who am I? And why do I care so much about Catalyst? My name is Peter Steinberger. I'm Stipete on Twitter. And I live in Vienna, Austria. This is my second time here in Poland after having the chance to speak at Mobile Central Europe a few years ago. Ten years ago, I founded a company named PSPDF Kit, and we built PDF frameworks for iOS, Android, Windows, browsers, and even the Mac. And in 2017, we also, finally, pushed our own app into the App Store and also into the Google Play Store with the surprising name PDF Viewer. Now, we got amazing feedback there and also have been quite successful with our pro subscription. And there was always two features that our users really, really, really wanted. And one was split-screen support, uh, which we shipped a few days ago with the iOS 13 update. And the other one was, drum rolls, a Mac app. Now, you might be confused. Didn't I just say we already have a Mac SDK? Can we just build an app on top of that? So the, the detail I left out is that we have a Mac SDK. However, this is just a model layer. Rendering, data processing, not any UI other than maybe a small example app to, to try the API. And if you've ever done anything like that, um, sharing model code between iOS and Mac OS is, is quite easy. Usually, most solutions that you have is they take the iOS code and then slap some methods onto the app classes, like on NS color, NS image, to retrofit what's not there. And this is really not that difficult, and Apple is like closing this gap slowly over the years. However, things get a little more difficult once it comes to UI. The Mac has quite a different idea how user interfaces are done, and rightfully so. There is a mouse or a trackpad, there's freely resizable windows, there's a much larger keyboard, a touch bar, uh, and more. And while Apple is working hard to make iOS a better computing platform, we got really good drag and drop in iOS 11, we got quite good multi-window -support, multi support in iOS 13, there's still quite a gap. And Catalyst is the promise to translate some of these UI kit APIs and concepts to the Mac automatically. Now, the promise is that it's just a checkbox, and things will work. If you worked on Apple platforms for a while, you know this is not the finale. This is just the start. Now, given all of that, you can see how Catalyst is still a very attractive thing for us. We have a large code base, quite a complex UI. Rebuilding all of that in UIKit would probably take years. Checking a checkbox is much more attractive, right? Uh, in fact, it's so interesting that I gave a talk about Marzipan last year. This was me at um, Troy Swift in New York. And back then, things were quite a little bit rougher. There was no checkbox yet. This screenshot is particularly awesome because uh, somebody took React Native and ported it with Marzipan to the Mac. And then people asked them, is it any good? And he was like, yeah, it's reasonably good. Um, the best hack back then was Marcy Penny 5 from Stephen Sutton Smith, who's still very active and ranting, uh, I mean, talking about Catalyst. Uh, this was a really, really clever hack, considering the things that people came up there before. One of the hacks that we had very early on was like, you just take voice memos, which is a Catalyst app, you load it, and then you load your own code and basically override what was in there, um, which was kind of weird, but it worked. <laughs> Apple also made it kind of hard a year ago to try and spelunkle in the system. You had to disable system integrity protection to do anything. And if you've heard like the recent Chrome update drama uh, with people that had SIP disabled, um, it's, it, it's useful. Keep it on. 
Now, a year later, we indeed got the production version of Catalyst. However, Apple spent barely any time on the keynote. Swift UI got all the fame. Remember the promise of Swift UI that you write code once and it can run on iOS, macOS, tbOS, and even watchOS. Even the name, Catalyst, was a last minute change. Internally, it's all called Marzipan or UIKit for Mac, given where you look. And given that macOS is called Catalina, it's certainly quite an interesting name decision. Now, on the website, Apple shows off apps like Twitter, TripIt, and Jira Cloud uh, as examples about the possibilities of Catalyst. I, I made a, a small table that really explains what technology makes the most sense in which case. Obviously, if neither time nor money is a factor, you will have the best result using the native frameworks to do the job, which is UIKit on iOS and AppKit on the Mac. However, we all have to work with constraints. And if you already have a good Mac app, just stick with AppKit. If you have an iOS app and you want to move to the Mac, Catalyst is very interesting. Then again, if you just start from scratch, SwiftUI, while still very young, is a great bet. And if you have a strong web app, you can reasonably also consider Electron. For example, I will predict that Slack won't go with Catalyst, because their mobile client is not as feature-rich as their existing Electron client. And they don't care or focus enough on the Mac to invest all this time and money to bring their existing mobile client on par with the features they have. So we'll probably not see that. On the other hand, Netflix. They have a great web client. They have a really great iOS and iPad client, which has the added benefit of offline viewing. For them, Catalyst would be a great addition to bring offline viewing to the Mac with very minimal time. Now, if they do it or not, it's probably more to do with licensing than technology, but I'd personally love to see that. Um, if you like movie references, Swift UI is kind of like the Austin Powers of frameworks. It's the hot mess if you like to live dangerously, but it's also incredibly fun. Now, on the other hand, um, Catalyst, it pretends to be this new thing, but it's really an old thing, bolted on something that's even older. Now, let's talk about the downsides. Where is the upsides already? Uh, both SwiftUI and Catalyst will require macOS Catalina. And that one's not even out yet. Actually, my notes are wrong. It's out as of last night. Um, so here's a quick overview of Apple, Apple's release cycle. You know, they're on this yearly schedule for a while now. And there's no indication that this is changing anytime soon. And it's also not, not a problem. Like, adoption on iOS is really fast. If you're looking at iOS 12, it was released in September 2018. And only four months later, we already had an adoption rate of about 80%. And of course, we have less data on iOS 13. But even though there was a little bit of bad press, there's no indication that things would go any slower. macOS is a different beast. One year after Mojave was released, it was at around 60%. One year, not four months. With High Sierra at 20% and Sierra and El Capitan still at around 10%. Updating your Mac is more risky. Apps break more easy, and especially Catalina will be interesting because it completely removed support for 32-bit apps. But, of course, you can always use Electron, which still supports any of these back to macOS 10.10, .10, the equivalent of iOS 8. This will be a problem for adoption, uh, as other long-term Mac developers, such as Craig Hockenberry, confirm. He's writing that he can't wait for all those Catalyst developers to realize that macOS customers hang on to older OS releases a lot more than iOS customers. Um, if you look at what's happening in the world, Dropbox just dropped support for 10.9, and here's somebody complaining about it. However, more UI-rich apps, such as Ulysses or MindNode, usually go with N-2, so it's not all that bad. And yes, I told you, breaking news, uh, Actually, Catalina is now the golden master, or is it? Because if you update, and I did that last night, it still says better on the about screen. So maybe we see just another golden master very soon. Anyhow, for us, it meant that we had to submit our app if we want to be part of the initial launch set of Catalyst apps. 
So if you haven't seen me yesterday, I was in the speaker's corner scrambling with my team to get the thing in a state where we can submit it. And we did submit it. So hold your thumbs that we will manage review. Oh, you, didn't, you weren't holding it good enough. After only 51 minutes, we already rejected. Uh, why? Because our entitlements include Game Center, um, which excludes us automatically to all iOS apps as soon as you have payment inside. And looking at Twitter, everyone was rejected. <laughs> So we explained it in the Resolution Center, and now we're waiting for review again. Um, so to sum it up, it's not great, but it's also not terrible. Let's see what happens. Now we talked about some time about the history and motivation for Catalyst. Let's step back a bit. What makes a good Mac app? We tend to forget what AppKit gives us, so let's very quickly revisit a few stock controls. And as a reminder, just because AppKit has some controls and UIKit doesn't have them, doesn't mean that you can't build them. Compare music, this is the gray app, uh, to podcasts, the dark one. Now, music is the successor of iTunes. They basically renamed iTunes, removed a few features. It's still iTunes underneath, it's AppKit, it's a lot of legacy. And podcast is taken from iOS using the checkbox and a lot of hacks and brought it to the Mac as a catalyst app. They both look similar. Could you tell just by looking at it which technology is underneath? Probably not. However, once you use it a little bit, uh, one detail that you probably notice is you see the, the volume slider. Now on music app, you can control the slider by scrolling because that's an app kit feature. On the catalyst app, you can't. Not because you cannot build it, but probably because it's not the default and somebody forgot to add it. AppKit has a lot of buttons and a lot of different styles. By the way, all of these screenshots I'm taking out from a blog post series from Martin Pilkington, uh, which is called Appreciating AppKit, which is a really great read and I recommend it's worth your time. Um, especially pull down menus that create separate windows are a little bit of a challenge in Catalyst. Now you have text input, and there's so many details. For example, if you use a search field, it has a recent search uh, area that is shared across all AppKit apps, things that are really hard to build, and you probably also don't notice if you don't know AppKit in and out. There's sliders, and while this is probably one of the easier things to rebuild, you get all of that out of the box if you use AppKit. There's a powerful date picker. UIKit has a table and a collection view. AppKit has that as well. But also, they have a grid and an outline. To be fair, um, nothing's free. Like AppKit's table view and collection view are not even remotely as powerful as the AppKit versions. If you've seen yesterday's talk by Paul Hudson, uh, you know what I'm talking about. There's a rule editor. Uh, there's a grid view. That's actually one of the easiest things to replicate. Uh, it's a fairly new component with fairly new. It was added in 10.12. Given AppKit's age, this is new. Uh, it just lays out content in a grid using auto layout. You can pretty easily replicate that with stack views. Uh, we also need to talk a little bit about limitations. So with AppKit, it's really easy to create popovers, and they just go out of your window. The difference is with Catalyst. You can still create popovers, but basically, this Chrome is the Chrome you draw in, and your popovers cannot extend the window, which makes a little bit of a weird user experience. So as a general, a general rule for building Catalyst apps is try to get rid of all your popovers. Instead, use sidebars. Don't use the, the push from a navigation bar. That's, I think, the most weird gesture in Mac ever. Um, just disable animation or use something that's more appropriate, like a fade. And instead of using UI toolbar, use NS toolbar, because it, that's what makes a Mac app a Mac app. And speaking about NS toolbar, AppKit really has a sophisticated toolbar system and even an integrated editor so users can customize them to their liking. This logic comes complete with automatic saving of the configuration. Even if you have multiple windows, it'll automatically update all your windows at the same time. This would be quite hard to replicate. 
And it's also very important for making a Mac app look and feel like a Mac app. So Apple did realize that and blurred the borders a little bit. So we got a little bit of AppKit. You can actually import AppKit, and there is even something that's called NS Toolbar with UIKit additions. Now you see that the above code is, is C, Objective-C, because if you import it directly in Swift, there are some problems. Not sure if they're still the case in the GM, but Apple's recommendation is to use a bridging header to bring this into the system. And then you can use Swift um, to actually use NS Toolbar, NS Toolbar item, and NS Toolbar item group, just as you would in AppKit. Another little detail. Um, Remember that it's called Catalyst. They did rename the environment in Swift, but they forgot to rename the thing in Objective-C. So up there, it's still called UIKit for Mac. And this is probably the name we're going to stuck with, because it's now GM. Now, let's look at our app. There's one thing that should not be possible in Catalyst. Can anyone guess which, which entry is actually in, shouldn't be there? Well, the search bar. So the search bar is a little bit tricky. Um, if I wouldn't know AppKit, I would expect that there would be an NS search toolbar item. But that's not how things work. You just have a regular NS toolbar item, which has a, a view property, which is an arbitra arbitrary NS view. And you slam an NS search field onto it, and then AppKit will do its magic and style it appropriately. To give you that in UIKit would have meant that Apple would have brought all of NSView over, which really doesn't work. You cannot mix NSView and your view. So I guess they ran out of time and couldn't figure out a solution. Um, I did speak to the engineers at WWDC 2019, and they told me that search will come in a later release. Now, this is Apple speak. A later release could be a later beta or in three years in some future macOS release. So a later release is as close as you can get um, in the Apple world. Now that we are in the GM and there is no search field, it'll probably not come. I did a little bit of spelunkling. There is a UIKit Mac helper framework. And you see that there is a UI and a search field toolbar item. So it seems they clearly worked on it, but they probably just ran out of time or couldn't figure out how to design the API. Well, the end result is we didn't get it yet. But if it's not available in Catalyst, why is it up there in my app? To explain that, we actually need to step back a little bit. And first, uh, I will show you that in terms of a simpler example. We didn't talk about cursors yet. AppKit has cursors. You notice the little thing you navigate around? Um, that's not something you usually have in mind when you build a new UIKit app. But the cursor is actually quite flexible and reacts to your content. It's a, it's a hand. It's like a. It's, it's the regular cursor. It's a resize handle when you resize an image. Um, and if you don't do that, your app feels really weird on the Mac. So to control the cursor, you have uh, the NS Cursor API in AppKit. You see, it's a little bit old, but it gets the job done. So let's just call NS Cursor, right? Right. This is part of AppKit, but this is not uh, the part of AppKit that Apple gave us. So this will just not compile. However, UIKit is still there in the runtime, remember? So you can do like evil things, like just fetching the class at runtime with our beloved NS class from string, and then abusing key value coding and actually calling pointing hand cursor.set, which returns a void. Um, that works. But it's not really nice, right? It's, it's kind of like. String-based coding, that's not really future-proof. We don't like that. It's not, not a better way. Yeah, it turns out there is a better way. So your Mac Catalyst app is still an AppKit app in the end. It's AppKit plus Apple's UIKit wrapper, so it renders UIKit. We can create an additional target, an app bundle, that compiles AppKit as AppKit, and then expose an interface that we use in our UIKit app. And then we take that bundle and load it at runtime into our app. And it's, here's how it looks like on disk. It really is a separate folder, dot bundle, and eventually you just have a binary which contains your additional code. And loading also is not rocket science. You create an NS bundle. Uh, you find the path, you create it. And then there's, there's one ugly thing. It doesn't really work in Swift. So you, in this case, you see I use a helper. 
an app kit bundle loader that is Objective C, which is basically one line where we alloc init the principal class. And then you can use it in Swift um, as you like. Then you have your, your custom app kit interface. And this is how this would look in, in an actual app. So we, it's, this is a very simple interface that wraps the curse API into something nice. I told you I don't like Apple's API, so I built an enum. And ultimately, you have a property that's called cursor mode that you can just set uh, any, anywhere from your application, preferably from the main thread. Now, back to search. This is basically the same way I created this search bar in AppKit land and then brought it up over into UIKit land. And in order to keep things simple, we use a block that's called whenever search changes. And then in this case, I have a, a toolbar management class that has a delegate that then informs the system about search, and then you do the things that you have to do. There's a lot of things you can do to make this code nicer, but I wanted to keep it raw so you understand and get the idea. The message is clear. Whenever you feel like there's something missing in Catalyst, you just reach out to AppKit and add it. Uh, with the exception of arbitrary views, you can't really mix UI view and NS view. Now, let's talk about the menu. Apple spent significant time and actually gave us a really nice API to make the menu work. There is a new UI menu builder, there is a UI menu system, and there is a UI menu class. And it's quite straightforward to just build a menu in code. Uh, it, it's a little bit different than AppKit, but it's almost as powerful. You can even add images. Just again, arbitrary views are not allowed because NS view, UI view. Um, and some of the classes you already know, um, UI command, UI key command. If you added keyboard support to your app, this is basically the same. And then ultimately, this is how your application menu could look like. Uh, one thing that's interesting to know is it uses the it uses a selector and then queries the responder chain to find the selector. So you always have to use add objective C in Swift so that it actually finds the, the method. And if the method is not there, then the menu is just grayed out. Now, we up the challenge a little bit. If you're looking at a typical Mac app, one of the most important things, or like things that you, people just expect, is an open, recent menu. That's really ubiquitous across Mac apps, and it's something your users will notice when it's not there. The bad news, of course, Catalyst has no support for open recent, and yes, I filed a radar. The good news, we can edit ourselves. All the API is there. So let's look at the challenges that we have to actually get an open recent menu in there. Number one is we have to be able to create an arbitrary menu. You just see the code, it's quite easy, done. Number two is we have to have a way to dynamically reload a menu after open. And I already told you there's a class called UI menu system. If you look a little bit down there, there is a set needs rebuild. So it will just rebuild the UI. So we can rebuild the UI. Check. Number three, we need to add images to the menu. Now, this was broken for a long time. I complained about it. They actually fixed it in beta 9. So this is now there as well. It's just a property on UI command. Easy. Then number four, we actually also need a file icon. Of course, you can fake it. You could just like use your own icon, but it's the Mac. You can change the file icon. We should show the correct file icon. And we get to that in a second. And then the last challenge is we have to deal with security scoped bookmarks. Now, to the file icons, um, that's a little bit of an arcane corner in UIKit, but there is the UI document interaction controller you initialize it with an URL, and then it has an icon property that just will give you the icon. If you look at the header, this class is there since the dawn of time. It's iOS 3.2, perfect. It's not marked, it's not usable for Catalyst, so let's just use it, right? Well, I did, and then eventually things just crash, and it just tells you UI document interaction controller not available. I mean, they, they could have just added that to the header, but they chose to just crash at runtime, which is an interesting decision, but OK. At this point, you're probably like, what? But remember what we learned. If UIKit doesn't give you the things that you want, you just get it straight out of AppKit. 
So of course, in AppKit, it's super simple. There is NS workspace. It returns an image. You can ask it for a file or even a file type. It's really, it's really easy. It will give you an NS view, but you want a UI view. So you can either transfer the CG image ref and then wrap it again, or you can do a PNG. There's multiple ways how you can get from AppKit to UIKit. Um, so check marks, we solved it as well. Now let's talk about security scope bookmarks. That's a little bit of an annoying topic, but you know sandboxing is important. And while you can use Catalyst in a sandboxed and in a non-sandboxed app, we want to be in the Mac App Store, so we have to play by the rules, and we have to deal with sandboxing. And if you have to deal with sandboxing, you need to use uh, two methods on NSURL. One is bookmark data, and the other one is resolving bookmark data. So one stores the URL in data, and one takes the data and gets you the URL again. And this magic allows you to access arbitrary files that the user gave you access to once, so you can like reuse this access. Now, there is a few details that you need to get right. Number one, you have to set an entitlement. Com, Apple, security, files, bookmark, app scope. There's also document scope, but that's not interesting for us. If you don't set this entitlement, it will just not work. It will not tell you you need an entitlement. It will just tell you permission denied. So thanks for the anonymous Apple engineer who like, helped me to get this working. Next up, you will have to set these uh, uh, options, create with security scope and resolve with security scope. Um, and then at the end, you also need to call start accessing security scoped resource and stop accessing security scoped resource. And the documentation is really scary. It says if you don't do that, the kernel will run out of things and will crash. So better do that. Now, again, there's a slight problem. If you look at the header, uh, you see that these options are there since OS X 10.7, but they're not available on iOS. But we're making a Mac app, but it's an iOS app that's ported to the Mac, so it's actually an iOS app. So if you use these options, it will not compile. So what do we do in that case? We just move from Swift to Objective-C. We look at the values. We just use the values. And if you're laughing at me for like being crazy, this was code from an Apple engineer. Uh, so I believe they'll fix that at some point. You can also do that in Swift. It's a little bit more annoying. Um, but this actually works, just not really pretty. So let's recap the challenges. We can create arbitrary menu items. We can dynamically reload the menu. We can add images, even though we have to go to the dark side for that. Um, and we now know about security scope bookmarks. And if you put everything together, you also like build a system that stores those things, maybe user defaults, maybe something more fancy, you have your pretty open recent menu. And I cheated a little bit there because it's just preview. That's not actually our app. Um, but I got it working. But I was sitting there. I was looking at all the code. And it's like, Catalyst, you're helpful. You are not. This is a, it's a lot of work. And a lot can go wrong. And it's like, isn't there a better way? You know, could, couldn't we? How do AppKit apps do that? Enter the world of NS document controller. Of course, AppKit has a solution for that. It's all about document-centric apps. And NS document controller is at the heart of it all. And you look at it, and it's like exactly what you want. You can register URLs for like uh, your recent used document. It has a clear method. Um, it can give you this method, and it can even deal with documents. So, you, and you already know how easy, how relatively easy bridging is. So we could just write a wrapper, access that in an AppKit land, and then like call up and down to UIKit as needed. So easy. The challenge is, how do we massage UIKit to also give us the menu item that we need, especially because the menus controlled in, uh, by UIKit and not by AppKit. So if we look at how things would work if it would just be in AppKit, this is, this is the code how you add an open recent menu in AppKit. And you see that actually that's already really ugly because it uses private API, because there just isn't public API for that. Um, turns out building a menu in AppKit is really arcane knowledge. There is a very interesting five-part blog post series slash story by Jeff Johnson, where he tries to rebuild the menu in code. And it's surprisingly difficult. 
Also, I'm glad that the website from 2007 still loads. Um, but eventually, he gets to the open recent menu, and he posted this important snippet that uh, told me how this thing actually works. And then at some point, our friend NS Document Controller populates this API with the uh, recent files. Now, we need to be a little bit creative. Remember, we built the menu in UIKit, and at some point, we need to call down to AppKit to tweak uh, the menu to like, really make the open recent menu one that AppKit knows. And there's um, build menus invoked by, by this Catalyst wrapper, eventually builds the menu, but if you don't get a callback when that's actually done. So as a very hacky workaround, we just use the run loop, wait one run loop, and then call into our bridge. And in our bridge, we, we just iterate over the menu, which is also kind of ugly, but works, find open recent, and then manipulate it to our liking. Now, this code is a little bit simplified. You need to actually hide the private API. Um, but I didn't do that to make it easy to read. So basically, we are combining the powers of UIKit and the powers of AppKit and making a hot mess until it all works. And it was 3 in the morning. I was like really clever and happy that I found a solution. I tried it, and nothing was working. Nothing was working. I was like, OK, I need to ship this. I need to sleep. We're going on a wine trip tomorrow. What the fuck? Something's missing. So what do you do if you're like stuck and you're almost there? Oh, yeah, right, of course. You just open appkit.c. You just decompile it. And it takes a while. It's a large file. It loads to 120 megabyte. And then you search for the one string that you know, NS recent document menu. No, that's not it. Yeah, here. This method apparently does things. So, so scroll up, yeah, a little bit more. And you find that our magical friend, NS Document Controller, actually has a method called install open recent menus. Um, and then if you read a little bit more, you also see that it's called very early on. It's too early for when, when our uh, UIKit wrapper actually creates the menu. So that's why it didn't work. So what do you do? I mean, you're already in. You're ready, the code is already crazy, so it really doesn't matter. So you're just at the end, once you're done with like modifying the menu, you just call the document controller and just call install open recent menus yourself. And after we did all of that, it's like almost four in the morning. The menu is working. I'm, I'm incredibly happy, and I went to bed. Now, is this actually legal? Can we actually do that? I'm not even talking about the private DBI stuff. This is fine. Uh, about actually using AppKit in Catalyst. So I opened the radar. I asked our contacts. Nobody could really tell me yes. But also nobody said no. And then the example that you got from engineers were like, here, use AppKit. So, so far, there's no clear answer, which again, is, is not great. It's also not terrible. Um, we are in review right now, and it seems like it'll work. So. Hold your thumbs a little bit better than the last time, please. So to recap, what did we learn today? We learned the history of Mac Catalyst, and that's actually called Marzipan. We talked about use cases and the problem of platform adoption. You saw a few screenshots on what makes a good Mac app. To be fair, this could be its own talk. You learned how you can create toolbars and what tricks you have to do to actually get a search field in. You learned about AppKit bundles and how to control the cursor. We went into the rabbit hole of security scope bookmarks and about the crazy madness, which is NS Document Controller. And remember, never underestimate the power of the Schwartz, or in our case, AppKit. Thank you very much, MobiConf. And if you try, if you want to try PDF Viewer yourself, you can check out a buff link for a beta. Uh, and if you like what you saw, let me know. Tweet with mobiconf2019 or Pete on Twitter so I see it. And with that, I say thank you.